All right. So hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Benjamin Premack, and I'm one of your hosts this evening. Uh, please give me your attention for a moment so I can tell you a bit about tonight's panel and a $500 donation, which will be made in honor of tonight's panelists to a charity that you, the audience, will pick from a list nominated by the panel. Uh, Becoming is an ongoing partnership between IGDA Seattle and Diversity Collective to highlight diverse video game leaders and hear their stories. Tonight's panel is the third of our 2022 series, and it highlights leaders in environment art. Videos of our previous panels starting in 2019 through the present um, are available on the IGDA Seattle YouTube channel. Uh, just a few words about your hosts this evening. Um, IGDA Seattle is a chapter of the International Game Developers Association, which is a professional organization and global network of game developers with the mission of empowering game developers around the world to achieve fulfilling and sustainable careers. If you're not a, a member already, I highly recommend you come join. Uh, and Diversity Collective is a community within Seattle Indies with the mission of supporting diversity and inclusion for, minority in, for minorities in game development. Uh, we have the opportunity tonight to learn from experienced and diverse leaders in environment art uh, who are each eager to share their story with you and to answer your questions. Please post your questions to Twitch uh, and the moderator will ask them during the Q&A at the end of the event. Uh, in addition, uh, I mentioned that there's going to be a $500 donation this evening. So the uh, six charities that have been nominated um, are Girls Make Games, the Navajo Water Project, Stand with Ukraine, Outright International, Maximum, the Maximum Impact Fund at GiveWell, and How's Our Neighbors. Uh, each of our panelists uh, and our moderator, August, uh, will say a few words about these uh, charitable organizations uh, when they do their own introductions in a moment. Uh, watch for a link in the uh, Twitch chat log uh, uh, where you can place your vote. And uh, just as a quick note, this donation is sponsored by Seattle Indies and by my law firm, uh, Premac Rogers. Uh, thank you again to all of the panelists uh, who are joining us, and thank you to IGDA for rehosting tonight's event on Twitch. Uh, I hope you'll find tonight's panel both educational and encouraging as you pursue your own careers. Uh, and with that, I will go ahead and pass the mic over to August, uh, who will introduce the panelists and kick things off. So thank you so much. I'll talk with you. I'll be back in about an hour and a half. All right. Thank you, Ben. Um, hi, everyone, and welcome to today's Becoming panel on environment art leadership. Um, my name is August. Uh, during the day, I am a character artist and rigger at Spry Fox. Um, and at night, I am a board member of the Seattle Indies and co-founded the Diversity Collective, uh, which is why I'm here to talk to you today. Um, I nominated the How's Our Neighbors uh, Foundation for the charity that you can vote on in the Twitch chat today. Um, How's Our Neighbors is working to establish a public development authority in Seattle with the purpose of buying and building permanently affordable housing in Seattle to ensure that it's affordable for everyone. Um, and donations go towards getting their initiative on the ballot in November, um, which includes the cost of their petitioning and legal fees uh, to write the initiative. Um, so now I'd like to introduce the rest of our panelists. Um, if you can say, uh, introduce yourself, what your current role is in the game industry, um, and what your first role was in the game industry, um, and what charity you've nominated today. I know that's kind of a lot all at once, um, but uh, we can get through this. <laughs> um, I'm just going to go in the order that you are in on my screen. So Tanya, you're up first. Hi, uh, my name is Tanya Pavisak. I've been freelancing as 3D environmental artist for about seven years now um, in video games and also virtual reality. I like to make properly modeling and um, hand painting texturing. Uh, before I hop into, so I joined into game industry, I actually work as design engineer in um, aerospace. That's why like making modular pieces and hard surface modeling are pretty much natural for me <laughs> moving from there. Um, for this, for the for tonight, I'd like to nominate the Girls Make Games charity because growing up, I did not know any female game developer. Like at the time, I didn't know anything. Maybe maybe there was like Roberta Williams at the time. But that's, that's the only person I know. So I would like people growing up kids growing up nowadays to have access 
to learn how to make games by going through like series of summer camps, workshop, and game jam design to help them. All right. Cool. Thank you. Uh, Jamie, you're up next. Hello, um, this is Jamie Rowe. I'm a concept artist uh, working at Probably Monsters right now. Um, yeah, so I, um, I've just been like totally enjoying all my life. And I, it's one of those cases of like people just like stumbling upon their careers. Um, I went to school in New Zealand, so I started my career um, in New Zealand. There's not that much industry there. So <laughs> they had this tiny little studio. They were making TV commercials. So I was working there for a few years. Um, but like one thing kind of like led to another. Um, my first like real job in game industry was at Nintendo, like making um, Nintendo style <laughs> environment pieces. And uh, and then I like moved to like MMO, making MMO games, um, sci-fi games. And then like now it's more fantasy. Um, yeah, so that was my career path so far. Uh, the charity that I'm nominating tonight is uh, stand up for Ukraine. It goes without saying, but this is the fund that will be used to help people fleeing uh, bombs inside and outside of Ukraine. So, um, you know, uh, if, if it gets chosen, uh, uh, it, uh, I think every, every bit counts. So like it could be a really uh, a good use and good cause uh, for tonight. Yep. Oh, thanks, Alicia. Hi, I'm Alicia Ford. I'm senior environment artist at Outer Loop Games. Been in the gaming industry for about 11 years now. Uh, started out as a contract environment artist and now I'm a senior environment artist. I've also been a world builder and uh, been able to help out with level design here and there. Uh, so I've gotten to touch a little bit of everything environment related and uh, the charity that I nominated tonight is the Navajo Water Pro Project. Uh, about 30% of people on the reservation do not have access to running water. So this charity, once they have enough money to supply a residence with running water, they go ahead and run the pipe and hook everything up in the house. Uh, super great small organization that's doing some really important work. Thank you, uh, Madison. Yeah, hi, I'm Madison Parker. Um, uh, I am the project art lead on an unannounced IP at uh, Bungie. And um, I started, I guess my first sort of industry job was um, uh, at Crystal Dynamics as a lighting artist on Tomb Raider uh, 2013 game. And uh, then I came to Bungie, was hired as an environment artist, sort of transitioned over to lighting team, uh, been there for uh, like nine and a half years. And yeah, so now I'm, that's kind of where I'm at. Um, and I nominated Outright International, uh, which is an organization that supports and advocates for like the human rights of the LGBTIQ community, and it's uh, which has been constantly suffering and continues to suffer abuse, violence, discrimination. Um, the organization has existed for uh, over 30 years. They have a permanent presence at the United Nations headquarters, and um, there's there's so many issues at the forefront. Uh, today and I actually honestly had a really difficult time choosing, but I felt like this was a, a solid choice. Um, they reached out to more than 75 or 65 uh, countries in the last year alone with like over $1 million. So um, yeah, that's my, that's my vote. Well, uh, last but not least, Josh. Oh, come on, I could be both. Uh, hi, I'm Josh and uh, I do level design and art both. I got my start in the like around 95, 96. So I've been in the industry forever. Um, I started mostly doing art and then started doing environment art and then moved into level design. And, and so I'm a big swirly ball of everything. Uh, right now I work on a UGC game called Blanco's Block Party. And my role essentially is like being a level design and level art lead for the community as a whole. So that's a really interesting sort of public facing and educational um, role. And it's it's really fun. I love it. And uh, I love talking about this stuff. Uh, let's see. So I nominated GitWell because I, basically I'm a robot and I like to try to remove my biases from things. And that's what GitWell does. They just beep, boop, beep, 
punch all the numbers in and are like, this will be the most effective use of your dollars. So that's what I picked. <laughs> well, so I just wanted to start off by getting, um, getting more of an idea about what it is that you're doing now as a weed environment artist. So this is an open question to anyone who wants to jump in to answer, but what are the misconceptions that people have about your, the role that you're currently in? Um, like what do people not understand about what it is being a, a lead environment artist? That is a very broad question. What do people not understand about it? Everything? Yeah, I mean, if you have to like when, yeah, when you're, when you're trying to explain to people like what it is that your job is, what do they think that you're doing? What are you actually doing? Well, the word environment always throws everyone off who's not in games. They think it has to do with eco stuff. And then you have to explain that. And you, uh, what I say is that it's like set dressing for a play or a movie, but it's the whole 3D environment that you run through when you play a game. So. Yeah, and on top of that, I think the the lead sort of title can throw people off because, um, you know, it, it maybe sounds like, oh, like they're the best artists. And it's, at least in my case, it's definitely not the case. Like uh, I'm just good at herding cats uh, as much as possible. And like, honestly, I'm just there to make other people look good. Um, like if I can do, or rather, I think it's the best when I'm actually not making uh, content work because there are a lot of people who are going to be able to hit that bar like much beyond my own skills and so it's yeah it's it's meetings and and documents is kind of like my my thing these days yeah i'd say something that people don't always think about with environment art even some developers in games is how much technical knowledge you have to know even if you're just an artist and you're never touching code or scripting you still have to have a lot of technical know-how and how to optimize best practices all that there's there's a lot more to it than just making something pretty i would love to kind of hear you dive into that like um a little bit more because um like we briefly chatted about like it it's just so like all encompassing like um and art is like extremely important but like i think it's just more of like understanding like the game making the flow or um uh, you know um or like creating the like the loop or the system like it's really really like crucial for environment artists like would, would you like to maybe um elaborate just a little bit more on that uh, coming from concept like I uh, and like I always kind of like marvel at like you know people's skills on other departments. So I just would love to hear more. Yeah, uh, you always want to make things look the best that you can, and so often there's a lot of tech limitations. You know, if you're going to a certain console, if you're going to mobile, uh, so a lot of times it's making everything look great and then it not running, and then having to read data of. Uh, what you're way over on. Is it polygons? Is it too much alpha drawing over top of each other? Is is there one prop that's been duplicated like 10 million times because it's one rock and we made a whole cave out of it because <laughs> sometimes that happens. Uh, and a lot of time it just on your single prop that you're making as an environment artist, you always have to be thinking, what size of texture can I get away with? How much alpha should I be putting on this? You know, where is it going to be placed? Is the level designer possibly going to be scaling this up <laughs> by a hundred? Do I need to worry about uh, level design and and I need to make sure that I'm keeping communication with them open because they might not necessarily know that that prop's supposed to be final, but now you've scaled it up to a hundred times and everything looks really pixelated. And so there's a lot of little things that uh, each department has to kind of check up on each other and, and making sure that we're not uh, stepping on each other's toes and, and really trying to make the best product that we can all together. Uh, so there's just, there's, there's a ton of little things that as a 3D environment artist, you gotta always be thinking about. I don't know if anyone else has, has I feel more like, to add. I feel like my relationship to uh, concept artists is just the guy who always lets them down because they make this incredible, gorgeous thing. And then it's like, I, I'll, I'll try. And, yeah. 
I, just do your I, best. <laughs> I think it took me like years to actually like figure it out, but I'm trying to get better at it. It's just that like, um, I mean, concept artists will never get to that full mindset of an environment artist just because like, like you know, it's just a different profession and you like work like a little bit earlier in the production cycle. So, um, so, you know, like we're never like really like, we can't never plan for all the changes that are coming down the road. Things are not built yet. But at the same time, like I am getting a little bit better at like, um, you know, building out the kits first the, the, or the sets first or like making things at more of an eye level. Um, um, those are the things that kind of like on the pre-production side, we had to kind of like learn um, and just looking over shoulders of environment artists. Like when you talked about like, yeah, like, the, the scalability of the things and then like making kits and um, it, it, it was always kind of like really, really interesting to see um, be, having having pieces that are like movable um, and still look good from all the angles. Yeah. Yeah, and there, to that point. Oh, go ahead. Oh, yes. oh sorry. I, I want to interrupt. There was something that, that you had said earlier, Madison, too, that you said that people get hung up on uh, the lead part of your title. And we have a lot of different titles here, like senior environment artist and lead environment artist. And I wonder if you can dig into like Don't what that means principle. And, and principle that we, what is the difference between these? Um, I mean, I think in my case, uh, yeah, honestly, like so much of it comes down to sort of like understanding the technical side of things. Like I, I have a pretty deep knowledge of like the engine that we use and um, and also the people you know responsible for the different components of it so um at least for the title for me it, it was it was mainly about that about understanding the the tech side of it and and sort of being able to be a go between between like say concept art or or, or whatnot into actual in-game pixels and make that you know as least of uh, as little as a letdown as possible it's still going to be you no know, spoilers there but like that yeah it's kind of what i get into And on the senior side, uh, Outer Loop doesn't have a lead environment artist. There's just two of us. So <laughs> one of us wouldn't be be the lead of the other. Uh, so we kind of just do things democratically and, and double check on each other's work and give feedback as needed. The whole team really gives feedback as needed, honestly. I'd be curious, Tanya, like as a as doing freelance, like where do you kind of see yourself fitting in with that that sort of like the greater project and what's the back and forth like? Well, like the way I see things about the different from from you know like aerospace and games is we make in game we are making pieces that can help with creating narrative. We're you know it is world building. It's we don't want to make in 3D, if you want to make the immersive experience, you're helping your writer, your level designer, your programmers, everybody to create this world. Even, even your character designer, like if you don't give them the right world, they will not shine as much. So I think this is what environmental artists do. And we're talking about like all, all the the different ways that it, like environment art means a different thing at a different studio and what part of it you're involved in but um tanya and alicia are both getting at like also how big your team is and just like how your company structured might also drastically change um like what the art team looks like or what your leadership structure is like in general so i'm curious to hear more like what your leadership team looks like like who are you collaborating with closely and um, like, what does that look like at, at your company? And um, like, how do you collaborate across across teams? So for me, since um, I usually work with like a really small team or just one person kind of team. So there's really no lead. So I, I work directly with the client. So fun. It's just more like I need to figure out what problem they have, how to translate what they have in mind. And um, that's pretty much it. So yeah, a lot of those lead questions, it doesn't really, I won't say really apply to me, but it's kind of like, you know, since I have to know how to wear different hats and some of my clients don't have the technical 
background to create what they want to do. So I need to help them understand the pipeline, understand the process, what needs to be done and such to bring out what they want to do. Even sometimes like tell them like, oh, uh, for this, you might need like actual character artists to create this, not like environmental artists. <laughs> so so that, that's kind of where I am. Yeah, yeah totally. my, oh, Alicia, go ahead. Uh, my current company is 15 people altogether. So we're, we're pretty small and scrappy team. Uh, collaborate with just about everyone. Uh, concept artists probably the most, uh, just because just that's where a lot of the ideas come from. And if I have an idea for something that's not been concepted, I'll just make it in 3D real quick and send it over to, to VJ and say, hey, does does this look okay? What what can I do to to zhuzh it up a little more and uh, come back with paint overs? And that's kind of how our back and forth. But I've also been on pretty large teams uh, working on MMOs and stuff. And that's where you get a little more specialized and, and siloed. But I like a more generalist role like I'm in now. I get to touch some lighting and also help with uh, making some things for, for UI and, and just Kind of expanding outside of just making 3D objects. I'm curious to hear if, if anyone here has the perspective of of the larger team, the like triple A, uh, like team size and collaboration. Um, I um, like right now, like probably monsters are teams tiny, like which I love. Um, I was at ArenaNet for many years, and that was about like 300 people studio, Bungie for a few years, and that was like 800, and then two partner studios um, running at the same time, and the concept works um, like cross-discipline, so that was a little crazy. Uh, <laughs> um, it learned a, a ton, so it was worth it. Um, in terms of uh, interactions with the environment team um, naturally like when the team is larger um, you know your uh, tasks and daily um, responsibilities get segmented and then you, you do need people who are just like managing the pipeline so you have a lot of like producers um, that has to kind of like um, you know be in charge of like triaging tasks and stuff so it's it's very different um uh in a smaller studio like when you guys talk about the fun world building like you get to play god and like create this whole world and um, you can sketch things out um uh and that's really really great um in a larger studio you get to watch this huge machine of like how game gets made and how pipelines run like you learn a ton you know so it's um it's it's a different kind of um, areas of kind of expertise that you get to kind of watch and like horn in um, on a smaller scale. Like one of the kind of the nice things that I learned is basically like bring the, the saying of like bring an eraser to a drafting table, not a sledgehammer to a construction site. Like so when when Alicia talked about like oh like you get to just like mock it up and then like just you know like ping somebody in the concept and then you can iterate as you go like um that part tends to get a little bit lost in a larger studio like i mean it's not totally lost but like it does get a little bit lost um just because of the pure size of it um but the back and forth iteration and collaborations um or or just kind of having that like creative freedom to being there first and then like fill out this like big canvas is definitely more uh, present in a smaller, smaller settings. Um, I guess it's just kind of where like where, where you feel compelled to be and like um, where you want to learn at, at that point in your life um, will probably decide and um, dictate where, where you want to be. But size of the studios do matter. And um, I, I was also a team lead for many years and I do kind of empathize with medicine of like, <laughs> you know, like uh, you go in, uh, there's less art and more other things, um, but you do learn tons about like game making and just the huge like mechanics and machinery of like how things run. And that was actually really, really impressive. And um, 
um, awesome to watch. Yeah. I, I, oh, sorry, Madison, go ahead. Uh, no, just, just off of what Jamie was saying, like I have gotten my art in like documents is so good. Like you guys, uh, PowerPoint presentations are through the roof <laughs> and I feel like I've learned so much from that. But, um, but yeah, I actually kind of went, I, I started with indie studios, then went to AAA and went to Bungie, which like, as Jamie said, was like 800 at the time and it's even bigger now. And then I was on Destiny for a long time, which was huge, it still is. And now the project I'm on at Bungie is much smaller. Uh, like I think it's 80 total and, and the art team is like less than 20. So it, yeah, you just feeling those shifts is, is very real for sure. Yeah, I, I wanted to point out like, there's an interesting thing about being like specifically the role of love environment artist slash designer, like, you know, since I play both sides there, but what's interesting is that in AAA, you know, when I was at arena net working on, you know, a team of three, 400 versus the team I'm on now is maybe 20 ish. Like the thing that is the same between those is that because we are the nexus of so many elements of the game coming together, that communication part is absolutely vital to excel in this role it means you're constantly talking to people in other departments and trying to understand them and their perspective, uh, trying to understand what takes them a long time and what doesn't, you know, so you can, it's kind of like leave as little footprint as possible. So if you need changes, you can speak intelligently to what kind of changes those are, as opposed to, you know, like, uh, again, getting back to what Jamie said about the, <laughs> the eraser versus the uh, sledgehammer. And so like that part is the same, no matter the size of the studio is you need to be talking to lots of people all the time. And to me, that's what makes it like such an exciting, like I feel like I'm at the beating heart of whatever game I'm working on. Like it is up to us to make sure that the intended tone of the narrative, you know, that the design flow from the designers is coming in, that the, you know, that the mood that is being set, it's so powerfully like done at this point at the level art slash design side. So, yeah. I, I had a lunch conversation a couple of days ago and we're just like talking about some like career changes. And then this lady I was talking to, she used to be like paralegal, like working at a bunch of lawyers before she changed the profession and now she's a developer. And they were just kind of saying like, oh, like, I have friends who are lawyers, but I've never met a lawyer who's happy with their job. Because <laughs> like so many times, like they'll go into the profession thinking like, I'm going to change the world, but like instead they're just like writing legal documents all the time, which is like not the fun job. And then I was like looking around saying like, oh, we are actually changing the world, like literally. Like <laughs> so, like um, the creative component of the job is like. It's, it's, you know, like when you get to actually play that, like um, that, that's just really awesome. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Jamie, you, you had mentioned um, when you were talking earlier about like the amount of learning opportunities that you have just at the studios that you've, um, that you've worked at. And I'm curious to know if like, if that comes from mentorship and like what role mentorship has played in your career and where you found opportunities for like continued learning um, since you've been in the industry um, and like do you now that you're a lead like are you mentoring um, some juniors in the industry now? Um, I am not the lead right now I'm just doing um, content creating there's like only two people in our team so <laughs> um, mm -hmm. um, you know it's it not actually it's not like necessary to have a lead nor like I have this kind of idea that like um, sometimes, I mean, titles more needed in a larger organization for sure. And um, and you do need somebody who's just basically doing that, you know, the traffic control of like, you know, like owning ideas. But when it comes to like artistic vision, like um, it's almost like art direction is the sum of the talent you have in hand. So like you need somebody who can actually like champion and then um, like, guide the vision of the team but at the same time it's, it's just one of those kind of things that you have to kind of play around um, in terms of mentorship like I think one of those like hard learned lessons that I think about is um, 
like not to take itself too seriously like like when I first started I just like I love my job like this is so important like I used to do that a lot and um I I, I remember this one incident I over documented I really wanted to understand the world that like this game we're making made this like huge documentation I think I was just trying to like prove to myself or, like to people that I work closely with they're like no I should get it I understand and like and I presented it to my boss and then he basically like kind of laughed at it. like everything that goes in the game is basically sh shit that we make up <laughs> it's made up so like and then it's, oh, sorry excuse me for the language but like it's basically st stuff that we make up and and then as it kind of like humbling as the experience it was like it was such a great learning experience to kind of realize that like oh you know like it really is you know <laughs> and just kind of have fun with it and like roll with it um and i think as long as kind of like if my mind's kind of set on that like the rest is just kind of like enjoy the ride as you go along and then like you know if you're having fun making you know making the craft or the art or the project then it will eventually come through so mentorship wise like yeah like kind of a couple of those like kind of you know really like hard you know like um conversations that I had those were like the more memorable ones than like the structured you know? <laughs> like yeah mm -hmm. so that's been my experience so the importance of like peer-to-peer -peer mentorship and just like learning from the people that you're working with rather than a structured like mentorship program that you went through I've, I've had experiences with structured mentorship like one-on-ones or like you get personal time with the you know the department head or like people managers those are really really helpful but at the same time like um you know like the ones that i actually re really remember are the ones that you know like they're a little bit more human you know like yeah, like the when you actually have a real conversation about like a real thing and then uh, those are the ones that i actually remember more so um or maybe it's just me that like you know kind of there's you know the game developers or like just creative people in general like there's a tendency to push back to like structured <laughs> like formal things just a little just a little bit maybe that's why but yeah yeah i have been really lucky to um just always kind of have great mentors and and it's, it's kind of especially true for like the soft skills or like um you know, just how to interact with others with stressful situations, all that kind of stuff. Um, and now there's a few people that I'm, I guess, like I'm sort of helping mentor in that regard. And like, that's usually the, the kind of the bigger things I tend to point to, like not, not necessarily just, um, you know, how to get your pixels the way you want them, but also those types of things that just that comes with like a collaborative environment. And, uh, and, and I actually, it's kind of fun too, because a lot of times I learn from other people. So I think I was showing somebody something in uh, 3ds max which i've been using for like a decade and he showed me something that i didn't even know and i was like oh my god like this for years i've been wanting this thing it's like, oh yeah it's just right over there i'm like great so i will never forget that because you know, now i know what i've missed for that long so. i'm curious to hear when you were um like when you're hiring for environment artists to join your team like what kinds of things are you looking for in people's portfolios when you're hiring or in their soft skills in an interview? Um, and are there any common mistakes that you see people make? Uh, I would just say like very fundamental is communication. Like they have to be able to state why they're doing a thing, what they're, what they're trying to accomplish. Um, ideally, they can also receive criticism and then articulate, okay, I, I see where you're going. Here are the things I'm going to change now. Like that sort of uh, oil in the in the gears. It's so necessary to make things work. That that to me is like more important than raw skill or anything. Like just the ability to iterate and to take criticism is number one. And not being afraid of asking questions, especially when you get that first job. That's uh, something that I've always 
pushed on uh, any new hires that I've helped train is ask questions. I'm not going to think you don't know how to do your job. I, I want you to ask questions, even though I have uh, years of experience, I still have a ton of questions on on random things. And I'll ask even new people that are new to the industry questions, because sometimes they'll they'll know things that I don't know at all, even though I've been using the same programs for for years. For for juniors, especially, um, I don't know how often you you do like portfolio reviews for junior artists, but um, do you have any tips or advice for um, them for getting their foot in the door and standing out among the competition? There's uh, Madison, you unmuted. So yeah, my, my my lighting artist bias is about to show here. Like I feel like lighting uh, is such a huge part of well everything, but like especially like in environment stuff and. I've seen a lot of things where it's like this is an amazing you know um substance material or or whatever but like the lighting doesn't really work there and and then conversely like you know someone could do a super low polygon scene and just light it and it looks amazing so like that's just for me um you know again i'm super biased that direction but i really think that will that will go a long way if you're trying to get your uh, portfolio up this is just a more of a genetic interview tip but like, um, like basically do your homework before you walk into an interview. It's really important. Like if you're interviewing at a studio for a particular game, they usually drop some hints. Of like play similar games before going into the interview. They will ask you questions. And if your portfolio doesn't align with their particular style, more often than not, it's okay. Like you just need a couple of pieces that are like similar to their style to match it and prove them that like, you know, you are actually capable and able to do it, you know? Um, and, you know, it goes kind of hand in hand with like the general like art style or like, or like our foundation of understanding composition lighting. If you can articulate that really well and have a few sample pieces along with like a range of like good quality work, um, that will actually carry you really, really far, but it's important to kind of like prep for it. And then, you know, like, you know, position yourself in a kind of uh, way that, that, that you can actually answer the questions that they will ask you, which is generally like, this this is the product we're trying to create. Like, can you do the job? Have you played this area? Are you interested in this like genre? Like, you know, have you read the books? Or like, do you understand the story? Like, um, you can maybe put in a couple of days of just prepping for an interview and then that will actually carry a long way. And um, you know, sometimes like people forget to do it and more often than not. So like, but like those are the things that, that will actually carry you really, really far. And quality over quantity is a huge thing. A lot of uh, junior people that I've, I've helped with uh, their portfolio, they're always so worried that they don't have enough pieces. And it's so much better to have, you know, three or four high quality pieces than 20 pieces and a couple of them are good and then some are just kind of and then there's a couple little questionable ones in there that'll make people kind of second guess your taste level and what you think is good so just really focus it's okay if if something takes you a long time because you're you're still learning and you're just progressing and getting to that point of having that high quality portfolio piece and you'll only get faster after doing that yeah, and you don't need your life drawing in there or your short stories or anything. You just focus on the thing you're applying for. Yeah, I, I think you were trying to add something too. I want to make sure you have a chance to speak. So mine is kind of different. When I land my first job, I actually don't have a portfolio. <laughs> but before that, I've been a lot doing a lot of like game jams and my own personal projects. So I'm familiar with like how some engine works, familiar how about, about level design and modeling. So when I talk to my client, when I try to apply for 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 a job for this project, I actually just like, uh, I don't have portfolio, but I have this scene I've been working on. Would you like to see that? And give it to him. So I understand a lot of people like hang up on their portfolio, but don't let that stop you. If you see a position or an opening that you want to try and you think you have the skill for it, go for it. Don't, don't, don't wait till, until you have the perfect portfolio. 
because portfolio is like it's a living document you you will keep updating it as you as time goes on yeah also another one is um don't put things you don't want to do in your portfolio because who knows you might get hired doing things you don't want to do game development lasts like a few years if it's something that like Arc you to do like if you don't like animation, for example, but you put rigging animation in your portfolio, you might get hired for that. So. Uh, yeah, it's also true that like you know, to your point, like do the things that you're excited about, and even if it's not necessarily like obviously marketable, like even down to like art styles, there's there's oftentimes like you you may not know it, but there's a project out there that is looking for you and, you know, it doesn't matter what you do and you do this thing. And if you love it and people see that you love it, you're just going to get it like a cold email one day. And like, I, I've never heard of this, but like they're really excited about it or or and honestly, like sometimes some of my best interviews were when I was showing showing stuff I had that was to like a completely different style studio. But they were like, it's, you know, this is the thing you're excited about. We can maybe make it work or we think we can kind of like work make it work in this other way and so um yeah definitely just just do the things that you're really excited about and make sure that that's what you start with i guess also uh, i want to touch on not not just like junior interviewing but once you're in the industry and you're for like progressing through your career if you're trying to move into a lead position for the first time or looking for a promotion within a team um like were there any roadblocks that you met like trying to get promoted within a company. Like um, part of why I ask this is because we don't see a lot of diverse people in leadership positions and especially not people who've been in the industry for a really long time. Um, so I'm wondering if you have ideas as like why that is um, and if there was like blocks that you hit along the way trying to get there. So uh, when I first got my senior title, um, uh, quite a few years ago, I uh, fought pretty hard for it. Uh, kept getting told that I didn't have enough experience, but I had like five years of experience and I'd shipped multiple titles and been at AAA. And uh, so I was just documenting everything that I was doing each time I was going and talking to design because my lead was too busy. So I would just go do it every time I trained someone because the lead was too busy to do it. I just documented over and over. And it's kind of good for, for you to know what your own skills are too and to remind yourself that you can do a lot of things. Uh, so when it came time for raises and promotions, the, the next year I came in with a huge list of like, okay, so you tell me a senior does these things. Well, I did all those plus. So why do I not deserve the title? And then I got the title. <laughs> so it's uh, sometimes you you have to really advocate for yourself. And I used to be pretty terrible about that with, with pay and getting promotions. And then I just reached my limit and <laughs> couldn't, couldn't take it anymore. Uh, so that's something that I think everyone, even when you're coming in at that entry level, you have to start getting used to advocating for yourself because you have to look out for what's in your best interest, just like a company looks out for what is in their best interest. Awesome. Really good advice. Yeah, really Go great ahead. advice, yeah. Um, like my case is like kind of the opposite side, like, you know, I mean, you've worked with concept artists before, so like we have, um, we have tendencies. Um, uh, I've been told multiple times in my career, like don't sell yourself short because, um, you know, like we, we kind of like find happy places of like, just kind of, you know, like doing like content creating and then like, um, very few people like to stick their head up and say like I want more leadership roles um, um that's kind of been like my experience in my department um yeah I, um promotions like I, I feel like you know in some ways like I mean there's two paths right one is like you have to kind of recognize that like creative field um the, like climbing the corporate ladder like it may not be as appealing to creative people as it is for other um like you know like 
like corporation structure like uh, companies. So like you, you kind of have to recognize it as a kind of a studio and the industry and then like find ways to reward people so that your, your experiences and your contributions like monetarily rewarded and then it's encouraged to actually get good at it and then get create, create content. Um, so you don't really corner people who would actually be like making great assets for the game and then doing great things for the game um, just because like they don't want to be doing the same thing over and over. So like, they have a career path, but at the same time, they're not actually moving into people management side, which is like completely different than like um, what e people initially interview for, sign up for it, you know? So like, there's like kind of like on that level, there's one one aspect to it. Um, I feel like that's like, you know, corporations or like the studios need to actually like have a solution for it. On the other side, it's like, okay, let's say like you want, you have artists who are like, have aspirations to do uh, more of like, management side and then they they do want they yearn for the title more, more responsibilities or they want to step out outside of the immediate role of like art creation then like then how do you actually like encourage people to do that and then create like opportunities for them like that's like a different um different problems that we you have to kind of like face and solve and when people talk about like diversity and opportunities like I feel like that's more in that room and the area. Like um, I myself like came from the art background. I was happy kind of to stay there, but like at that time their studio needed a lead role. And, you know, like my boss called me out and said like, hey, you should take this one. And I said, no. And like, he was like, no, honestly, nobody else wants it. You have to take this one. So like, <laughs> that's how I got my promotion. And I stuck around with it. Uh, for many, many years. Um, but at the same time, like, um, you, um, I think, like, for those aspiring artists who are actually, like, okay with moving away from less of content creation and then more into people management, the overseeing, like, a bigger project, um, culture becomes a bit of a problem it is true like you know because as you move up the tiers you will be bumping into other people who have been in the in the industry for many many years and then they have their own set of cultures and they're usually like um uh, they're usually like more of like um they have their own kind of nuance or like um or or um esoteric like ways of doing things so like if you wanted to actually like have create an environment that is a little bit more welcoming to newcomers um that's that's the real conversation of like diversity and equal opportunities come in so um sorry i'm kind of like <laughs> just going off on this but like what i'm trying to say, trying to say is that like if you're an artist coming into the industry like i feel like at one end like one end like there has to be a path for artists who just want to be an artist to be rewarded over a long period of time on the other hand like people who actually have a career ambition like okay like there has to be a cultural shift to actually like welcome the new people who are coming in into these established groups. So that was kind of a long runway to get into that uh, at that point. Yeah. Sorry, <laughs> very long. <laughs> I'm, I'm curious to know, I mean, you or, or anybody else on the call, like if you are joining a team where you feel like that culture shift needs to happen, like how do you approach that conversation? That's like, you know, I think, you know, X needs to change or this way that we talk about this needs to change, um, especially with somebody who might be your superior in the company. I think it's just super easy. It just, you just think it and it happens. That's usually how I suspect. Um, now, I feel like that's, that is one of the hardest things, especially when it is, like you said, kind of like a superior. Um, the only thing I've found is that sort of like working with your peers to sort of develop that culture and sort of like kind of organically create it. Um, you know, like in work from home environment, uh, at least for me, it means like, you know, everybody's on chat, uh, text chats and like start one that's about cats or one that's about whatever. And like, you start to like, just get to know people on like more of a personal level and it stops being this like weird corporate uh, ladder and like you, yeah, it takes a while to, I think, get people involved in that. And some people just probably never will. But you, I found that's like the best way to break through to through that kind of like wall in a way. So. Are, are there other ways um, in which you are changing uh, the work environment, like within your team or just for yourself to 
enforce uh like positive work-life balance and like a positive work culture for you I think especially like creative people are like you're the the passionate like you need to stop like not crunch or put some put work down um and like how does your team address that or how do you enforce that in your team This is for anyone, but I might I might pick on Josh because you haven't said anything for a little while. <laughs> I mean, I'm the I'm the one totally <laughs> blazing white guy here. So uh, I've also been around since forever. I mean, to me, my my role is to listen to other people, and uh, when I see exclusionary stuff happening, call it out to my peers and say that's not cool. Um, the Studios that I've worked at, for the most part, have been like really proactively, you know, seeking to to make these changes. But it is one of those things where, from what I can tell, it's like a cultural thing that has to happen out there. So to that end, like I've been in organizations like Women in Gaming, and um, I can't remember the name of this other one. It was like uh, where we were talking to uh, grade schoolers in like. Southside Chicago about like careers in game dev and what it's like and that kind of stuff and helping them with like through projects of designing games and that sort of thing. So like that sort of proactive stuff is, is what I try to be engaged in as much as I can and then I, mostly listening. So. Um, oh, Alicia, go ahead. Uh, I'm really fortunate at Outer Loop. We're a very diverse team. Uh, we're uh, super commutative and there's there's no like top-down toxicity or anything, uh, but I've definitely been in those types of situations and it's really hard because it does come from top-down. You know, the, a lot of times, I guess, lower in the trenches when you're in like those really big, uh, huge studios, it can get hard because there's not a whole lot you can do to change things other than just keep speaking your mind. Um, so now that I'm at a place that I'm very happy and comfortable with, I've been trying to spend a lot of my free time mentoring, uh, trying to get more uh, people that are underrepresented in games, getting a job in games. Uh, I work with game heads of Oakland in California to uh, help mentor kids that are coming out of high school and just starting college to to learn how to make games and, and how to get that first job in the game industry. Uh, I'm curious to hear, uh, Tanya, from your perspective as freelancing as well, like how is this different for you to maintain uh, a, like a good culture for yourself, like working independently and a good work-life balance for how you manage um, like your, your work time with clients? Yeah, definitely. Uh, for my client, I try to have like a hard time. Like, you know, please do not contact me after seven o'clock or something or on weekends, you know, like I don't want to work on weekends. And then I know this when, whenever I do Game Jam as well, because there's a lot of like college students going into Game Jam, they want to break into game. Whenever I'm in a team, I want to make sure that they have time to go home, they can you know, this is what we still have like on-site game jams, time to rest, time to go home, you know, make sure you take a break, make sure you don't always try to make a product, walk around, talk to people, because, you know, this kind of situation, that's when you learn. You're not learning by just sitting there and making games. You learn by like actually networking, talk to people from different background and stuff like that. So, and like, the more I do this, a lot of people start realizing they can still make good games, because they still can make good product without crunching. Because game jam, most of the time, it is crunch. So instead of like trying to make your game so great and wonderful, is figure out like the scope of your project in a way that fit with the work-life balance you have for that weekend or for whatever, however long your project is and i'm hoping with this that the people who work with me get idea and spread it around next time they do their own project or their own game jam they they, they can 
they can have like a healthy lifestyle while still pursuing their passion. Yeah, I, I think that's one big change I've seen is that um, the the way that we talk about crunch and crunch culture, I think has changed over time and definitely for the better. Um, that I'm curious if there's other, other things like that, especially for those of you who've been working in games for such a long time, like what's the, what are big changes that you've seen from when you started working in the industry to what it is now? I think I go back the furthest. So, I mean, I think everyone understands, like initially it was pretty much a frat house. Like that's what game dev was, uh, certainly in the nineties when I started there. And it's just been a slow, very slow, painful evolution towards something better. Uh, the, the, <laughs> God, it's, it's been an amazing set of like cultural norms shifting at the same time, like the broader culture obviously has been shifting as well. And tech is in this weird spot where like it's, it's office, but it's also like developing software. And, and so there, there's these weird, like mixes of things so it's not like for instance there's like hollywood right which is kind of on the cutting edge of like cultural evolution and stuff like that and then there's like office work and that's like very different sort of thing and we're like in this weird middle ground so um it's there's always a swirl where you'll get like some old timers who are very crotchety and like want things to be the way they used to be and then there's like the the avant-garde cutting edge like trying to push us towards something better. Um, and it's, yeah, that that's my experience is just this evolution. And of course, when I started, I was like 20. So like I was very, very young and now I'm very old and <laughs> it's just been a massive radical change. Um, and I'm personally totally on board with it. And I'm very happy that we're going in the direction we're going and I, I wish we could get there faster. Yeah, I think like kind of to your point, like even just the types of games that exist has broadened so much, even in like the last five years, um, which especially was helpful for me because like there's like the cozy game sort of uh, wave and like that is I couldn't be happier about that. Like that was for sure, like when I found kind of like my tribe, I think, and um, just it would not have occurred to me, you know, seven, 10 years ago that such a thing would exist or that it would be valuable or valid or whatever. But um yeah, it's kind of amazing because it just like whatever you're passionate about, like you can actually make something that people like. And it's it's just nice not to have to like feel like I'm trying to mold into something else. I think the fact that we went from like dominantly a power fantasy, you know, fulfillment service to like a true artistic expression that can impact people's lives for in positive ways. is just incredible to me. Yeah, it's it's been an amazing journey. Uh, we're going to be getting to the uh, Twitch live Twitch Q and A in a second here. So if you have questions for the panelists, drop them in the Twitch chat, and we'll be answering them in a second. Um, but before we get to that, and we'll, we'll give them a chance to think about what questions they might want to ask, I'm curious to know like what what you're most excited about going forward, like with your own work, or what you're most excited about in games. Um, and the future of, of your own uh, work in game development. I'm going to call on people for this because I, I kind of want to. Yeah, get you better. Everybody. I could so, go forever. And I'm, <laughs> so, talk, talk, so Josh, no, go ahead. You you volunteer yourself. <laughs> okay, I'll I'll be fast because people haven't talked as much as me. But a uh, procedural content generation, I think, it has this incredible future where the synthesis of you know design programming and art are all coming together to create like stuff that was unimaginable in the past, like opening up all sorts of different artistic avenues that haven't existed. I think that's incredible. Um, I think user generated content is also an incredible like path that we're going down. Like, like on my game, I'm not only working with the community to build the levels, but I'm also designing the level building system. And so like seeing that and the creativity that is sort of latent or untapped out there um, that, that are better tools and technology and culture can bring in more people to do that. I think we're just, I, we're, we're still nascent in video games as an art form, as like a medium for artistic expression. And so I'm just very excited to see all of that blossom in the future. Okay, I'll shut up now. Cool, <laughs> thank you. Uh, Jamie? Well, um... 
individually as an artist, I feel like I've operated under the assumption that like I am an artist working for a client, you know, um, whether it's the art director or the game designer, like a QA person. Um, more and more, like I'm learning that like the things that I'm passionate about are um, like the most personal to me could be the most universal. So like instead of making trying to make something that a million people would like, like I want to make something that maybe ten thousand people love, you know. So um, and I I think that will ultimately translate to people actually like caring and adopting, you know, like the content that I create. So on a personal level, I'm excited to kind of like try. to use that philosophy on everything that I do, like, you know, rather than things that are genetically like, you know, I want to make something that like people actually really like love, you know? Um, so um, that's kind of the thing that I'm excited to do. <laughs> yeah. And just continue making more art. Yeah. I like that mentality a lot. That's cool. Um, Alicia, you're next. Yeah, I'm, I'm super excited for, uh, the game that I'm currently working on, uh, Thirsty Suitors. It's been, like I said, the most diverse group of people that I've I've worked with and we're making a very diverse forward uh, cast. It's going to be telling a story of people that don't get stories told. Uh, it's it's definitely been a labor of love and I am really excited to, to put something out that's positive like that in the world and uh, be able to... Uh, have a lot more say in the art style and, and what I've been making and, and just being able to give way more feedback on, on different aspects of the game. It's, it's definitely felt like more of a piece of me than when I've been on uh, big teams. And I'm super excited about uh, a couple of my mentees. They're getting so close to landing their first job. It's, I'm, I'm like mother henning over them and just so excited. <laughs> uh, Madison? Um, yeah, for me personally, I mean, I guess uh, yeah, the, the game I'm working on is like the most excited I've ever been for a game. And I think largely for, for a game I've worked on. And um, it's because I'm actually kind of like able to bring my own influences to the table kind of more meaningfully and um, yeah, more creatively. And it's, it actually helps too that a lot of the people involved are, are good friends of mine, have been friends for years. So we just, we like, we click really well, but Um, but yeah, that's, I think in general with like kind of everything, games, game art, like I, I want to see people's personalities and like, I love, you know, bringing in those things that, that matter to you. And so that, that's exciting to me. And then kind of to Josh's point about community sort of things, like I love anytime I hear a story about someone who says like, ah, you know, I, during the pandemic, I reconnected with this friend over this and we like, and that's, you know, that's how we became friends again. And Um, there's actually been a few games like that for me, for some of like my old college friends, for example, but like anytime you can have a world that, or a universe that kind of has its own life, that's just completely separate from the actual game itself. Like that's what I get excited about. Cool. Uh, Tanya? So I'm excited that I can help people to bring out stories from like underrepresented groups with my clients and also Um, a lot of games are now like related and they can help with mental health or general or general health. Also, there are more and more short games that's satisfying. As I'm getting older, I cannot do like MMO comedy like 20 hours a night kind of deal anymore. So um, yeah, I'm looking forward to like more cozy games now. Cool. Uh, we have a lot of really great questions coming in from the Twitch chat, so I want to jump over to those. Um, and just to make sure that we can get to all of them, we'll have like one or two people jump in to answer um, the question, and then we'll move on to the next one. Um, so the first question is, what was the most useful piece of advice that you received as a junior environment artist? On the... Uh... One of my first art directors said about the world that you should be able to stand still uh, doing nothing and you should still feel like the world um, breathing around you. So, you know, that goes into things like animation of like uh, effects and and just, and like the, the way the lighting changes, basically just um, the world should be alive even without us touching it. And I just, uh, since then I've always loved that. Oh, I just thought of a good one. Take screenshots of your levels from all sorts of different angles 
and then pretend you're presenting them to someone or actually present them to someone, you will find a trillion things you want to change like instantly. Awesome. All right. Those are good answers. Um, we have another question. Um, our team is pretty small, so we don't have an environment concept artist. Is this normal? At what team and game size does it become necessary to concept environment rather than kind of design it as it's built? So much of that depends on the style of the game. Like if it's a, you know, 3D, full 3D, or like looking down or 2D, it's hard to say. Um, as a concept artist, I would say probably doesn't hurt. <laughs> Um, <laughs> uh, I mean, you know, I, I, it's the, it, I mean, it depends on the type of game you're making, right? But, um, I, I don't, yeah, I, I always kind of use that old, like, you know, the old, um, Game Boy Mario game as an example of like what concept task can be like, you know, like you have like Mario jumping on the platforms, like Mario is the character design platforms are the props you know interactive props and then like the the sc scrolling background is the background art like <laughs> sometimes like you know um it does add to the world um if your team is very small maybe just hire a freelancer for a little bit even if it's bad art like if you put it in there if it doesn't look good that itself will actually tell you what needs to be fixed so um so concept art, if it's a small project, small team, definitely a freelancer could be an option. And there's a lot of talent out there. So, um, you know, try them out. If it doesn't work out, you can always find another artist. Like that's how I would say it as a concept. <laughs> but yeah, hopefully that answers the question. Yeah. Yeah, for me, like we cannot read minds, right? Everybody, every artist, everybody kind of have their own vision of certain things. I think having concept artists kind of able to have like cohesive visual of what everybody's thinking. So I really wish when I work with my clients sometime, like oh, we have a, uh, a concept artist to help understand. And a lot of time I actually have to create concept for them. And it doesn't have to be like super pretty, like uh, Jamie said, you know, like it's stick figures, blocks, just, you know, just some lighting and and sometimes that's enough to start. So yeah, if you can hire someone else, a freelancer to do that, that'll be great. But if not, have someone to actually like doodle something, <laughs> put something together. Well, um, our next question is, are there any books you'd recommend for references and inspiration for environments? In general, I really like books from movies that, you know, the, the art book of whatever, you know, Lord of the Rings or Avatar, you know, whatever those always have lots of incredible stuff. And uh, most of them also have like, um, like progress work or like rejected things. And all of that really helps to inform like, oh, okay, I see the thought process that happened there. So that's a good start that I wish there was, I don't know of any like, environment design for games books out there maybe i should make one hmm. if you're really into architecture like i am uh there's a huge textbook called elements of design and it goes over like a lot of different designs it's mostly western designs unfortunately but it will teach you all about the different parts of a step and what uh different types of fireplaces there were from like late 1800s to now and it's just a wealth of of information and you'll learn names of things that you never thought you would know the name and and how exactly like trim pieces and stuff are made for windows and and uh rooms and everything so i think that one's really good and just in general for artists i think the book how to steal like an artist is really good to just get over the thing of like, I got to make something super unique. We're all stealing from each other. Don't, don't get caught up on that. Just quickly throw out there. Um, uh, Studio Ghibli, uh, Miyazaki has tons of art books. Um, you probably never find a better mood painting than something like that. So just pouring through those, like you'll always get some inspiration, my take. 
Well, um, our next question, um, it was mentioned a bit about what mid-level slash junior portfolios should contain, but what about those who are starting out? There's much competition out there and it's hard to know what to focus on to help land a job or even build up the confidence to go for a job in the industry. Any advice? What I tell everyone who has zero experience is just go to a game jab, game jab, game jam website. There are millions of them. Find a team who's looking for someone to do a thing and start making stuff. Tutorials, there's millions of tutorials out there. Do your best. You're going to do terrible the first couple of times, but they don't care. Like most people, <laughs> most people in a game jam are pretty terrible also. So it's just like, it's just like anything. You start doing it and you develop your skills as you go. One, one of the quick ways to make your uh, portfolio look good, and this is kind of a cheat, <laughs> um, is um, when you have, um, whether it's like a screenshot or a composition things, like um, stays it nicely and then put it up there. Like you will still view like portfolios in 2D forms, like even though it's like environment art. So um, it really doesn't like hurt to do homework for presenting yourself to an interview or like a job. Um, like creating your portfolio like one is like make it easy to access like don't create your home like portfolio site that needs a password you know like like oftentimes like when you're screening like hundreds of candidates like you want you will give about like three or four seconds to each candidate like you know so like make your website accessible it sounds simple but of, like oftentimes like the, you know you guys kind of miss on it make your like sites really accessible um easy to click easy to view when you create like screenshots or view shots, like lighting does wonders, like, or like color, like basically like to color grading on your pieces so they look harmonious and good. Um, make sure you create like good thumbnails on your shots. Like you'll be surprised. It's just like going to like a dating website, you know, like you want to have a nice profile pic, like it's the same thing, like curate your portfolio size so that they look good. It doesn't have to be pure raw image of the screenshot. It's okay to cheat a little bit, Photoshop it a little bit, like, like make it just a, like a pretty, like even that skill itself shows you artistic skills. So, um, and if, if, if anybody's kind of confused on like, how do you improve your images? Like go back to the art foundations of creating like nice crop, nice color grading, nice composition. Um, and then that itself will actually, I believe it will carry you a long way. Yeah. So um, like, if you have, oh, sorry. If no, you have go ahead. If you have a particular company you want to work for, you know how like people like fan art of characters and stuff, you can do the same with environment with props. Like for example, you want to work for, uh, I'll just pick Blizzard for example. Well, you like playing, uh, wow. Try to make props that fit into their world. Your own, it could be your own idea of a prop and you can try to match with like the mood, the lighting, how they look. And I think that's, that's a good start if you're not sure where to start. A few of the cliches that I heard and like, correct me if I'm wrong, like again, like not really an environment that is here, but like at the same time, like um, the avoid cliches too much, like for a while, like um, I was talking to an environment lead and then he said like, as soon as he sees a dirty toilet, he just clicks away because everybody does it. You know, there's like scientific lab, he does it like, you know, the grungy like brick wall, like everybody is like making like, you know, assets that look like everybody and then the fast go in and out. But like, there's nothing wrong with having those, but don't let that be the focal point, you know, of your like major collection. Like just have something that will make you stand out from other things that are out there, like oftentimes it draws from your personal favorite habits, hobby, anything like, and that's okay to like put it forefront and personal. Cause like when you have thousands of portfolios to review, the individuality of you is the one that will make you stand out. So it's okay to put those out there. Yeah, on, on that note, I would say go to TurboSquid or any of those asset stores see what they have there and don't do that because like there's already people doing all of those things don't make a cedar tree don't make you know like a, yeah there's... <laughs> please well, uh, all right our next question as a freelance artist what are the best websites slash communities to find work um i actually don't 
use any website. I go on site usually and go networking because I, I find my clients through game jams, through hackathons, and a lot of jobs, believe it or not, are never posted. So I think building that connection with people, building your network, make sure you network before you need a job. And also while you network, you don't just like, hey, give me a job. You're like, um, how can I help you? Because you never know, you can connect people during that time. You know someone who can do something, you connect them. Later on in the future, they're like, oh yeah, I know, you know Tanya does this and this, and this person did that, and they'll do the same to you. So that, that's how I find my jobs. I'm gonna add just one more thing, because I actually think it will help like, um, like young people coming into the industries. Um, yeah, like just basic networking etiquette. Um, it goes without saying. And then oftentimes like people uh, overlook those because they're shy or like nobody's actually taught them about those kind of simple etiquettes. For example, like if you call call somebody or like ping somebody you don't know on LinkedIn and then you get a response, make sure you reply back. <laughs> it's just one of those like etiquettes. Like I've actually forwarded portfolios for colleagues that I've worked with and then they never respond back. Like, you know, it's one of those things that like, it's a courtesy, common courtesy to say like, hey, thanks for forwarding my portfolio. I got an interview or like maybe it didn't like just do that little follow up. Um, so, it, you know, it's, it's those little things actually like, especially if you're coming out of college, you're shy, you, you know, like, <laughs> or like, or, um, Maybe you're not, but like, you know, if you reached out to people that you don't know, um, it's a first step to building a relationship, even though it's online. So just, you know, that little little common courtesy, courtesy of like, you know, like do a little follow up, say a little thank you, or like check back in on people who actually reached out to you. Um, I, I think those go a long way. All right, our next uh, question. Why are there so few junior three art roles? And like I said, mentioned before, a lot of jobs are never posted. It's not just they don't exist. It just they got filled up so fast because, again, if you know someone who fit that role, they reach out right away before it's been posted. Jobs, well, hiring people are expensive. Hiring process are expensive. So that's why you see more of senior position out there on the website because those are the hardest to feel. So, yeah. There, um, I think more and more studios are adopting things like early in career uh, hires, which is basically like, you know, a, a set of hires that are specifically only for people who would be kind of in that junior category or maybe like even younger, like maybe they're in college or high school and like sort of setting up that, that path for them. So. Uh, definitely take a look out for that. Um, uh, yeah, I don't know how widespread that is, but that's something that Bungie is doing nowadays. So, it, you know, look for that type of tag. It might exist out there. All right, uh, we have one more question and then we'll get to our, our closing uh, remarks and the result of our charity vote. Um, and that will be in the Twitch chat as well. So if you haven't voted on which charity you'd like to receive the donation for tonight, um, take a look in the chat for the link. Um, so our last question is tips for people pivoting into 3D art from the outside. I'm not sure if they mean outside of games entirely or from a different uh, career within games, but um, outside of 3D art. The internet is amazing. YouTube is amazing. There's so many tutorials out there. You'll find someone that lines up with how you like their voice, how they explain things. There's there's just a ton of people out there. Um, Blender's becoming more and more popular. It's free. I'm a Maya user. I use Blender once in a while, but Blender's free. So try to learn things as cheaply as possible. Like just because you're spending money doesn't mean you're making better stuff. Uh, so go however works for you and as cheaply as possible. Yeah, I would also say that there's 
uh, along those lines, there are a la carte classes out there through a variety of different websites. And what that gets you is access to a professional, usually, <laughs> who's happy to like give you feedback and you can talk to them and ask them tons of questions. And they're usually very happy to answer questions. Um, shameless plug to my YouTube channel and Twitch where I teach art and design. So there you go. And I'll, I'll, I'll jump back on it real quick. There's also quite a few developers. I'm one of them that's on this mega list on uh, Twitter of being willing to help out people that are new to the career or uh, still trying to figure out their career. Even if you've made it into the industry and you, you just need advice, there's a bunch of us that, that can uh, help you however we can. I'm super lame and don't have a Twitter, but I would totally be in something like that. So LinkedIn or wherever else, if anybody finds me like, yeah, I'm always happy to be excited uh, to talk to people. Cool. All right. I'm going to uh, throw it back over to Ben to see if we have results of our um, charity vote for today. And then we'll um, do one last round of uh, closing, closing remarks and plugs uh, for all of our panelists. Um, so Ben? All right, thanks so much, August. Uh, Terry, actually, I was about to ask you, uh, do we have the results for today's uh, charity poll? Let me put my voice on. Hello, hello, everybody. Uh, the winner for tonight's charity poll is actually a two-way tie. Uh, we've got an equal split between Stand with Ukraine and we have Navajo Water Project as tonight's winners for the charity poll. Outstanding. So each of them will receive $250. Um, thank you so much, for everyone, for participating and for voting. Uh, so we will have another Becoming panel uh, this fall. We haven't yet uh, nailed down the date or the topic. So if you have something that you would like us to talk about, um, or if you have a group of panelists you would like to hear from, uh, please you know, feel free to reach out to us um, over at IGDA Seattle. You can find our contact information on the website. Uh, and the summer is mostly going to be full of social events. Uh, so uh, coming up in later in May, we're going to be doing a boba social. Uh, we'll all get together over in the International District um, at a boba restaurant over near Wajimaya uh, and um, just have an opportunity to chill and hang out and see each other in person for the first time in a very, very long time. Um, and we'll probably grab a uh, boba tea and uh, walk over one of the parks over there and um, just hang out for a bit. Um, I don't think we've determined the date for that yet, though. Have we? Do you know, Terry? Uh, I don't think so. I need to check okay. in and confirm. All right, we'll, we'll confirm that date. Um, and then later in uh, July, on July 16th, we're going to be doing our um, annual picnic um, over at Magnuson Park. Uh, that'll be all day. Uh, we'll be renting one of the uh, picnic areas and we'll be there with, you know, picnic games and food and drinks and opportunity for everyone to come chat and hang out. Um, uh, there will probably be people there at the picnic area from about 9 a.m. Uh, until about 5 or 6, just, you know, over the course of the day. So uh, drop by whenever you have a chance. So, and uh, of course, the panelists, uh, you are all very welcome, wanted and invited uh, to attend these events. So. Thank you all. Does anyone else have anything they'd like to say before we sign off? Uh, yeah, I'd like to do one more round while uh, for all of the panelists. I'll, I'll call you in order of how you are appearing on my screen and just, um, yeah, let everyone know um, like where, where people can connect with you online. If you have a Twitter or LinkedIn or if you want to plug your game or project you're working on, um, now is the time. Um, so, Tanya, you want to start? Um, well, I use Twitter most of the time, but mostly to like just repost that. <laughs> uh, you can find me at Chinidro on Twitter. And if anybody has any question, feel free to reach out there as well. Cool. And Jamie? Ah, you're muted, Jamie. Hi. <laughs> yeah, so, um, yeah, so our station and Instagram, Jamie underscore row art of Jamie Rose. So yeah, that's where you can find me. Alicia? You can find me on Twitter, Instagram, and I think ArtStation as well as Alicia F. Uh, so 
feel free to hit me up for any questions that you've got if you're needing help with things. Uh, and I'll I'll plug uh, the game that I'm working on, Thirsty Suitors. Uh, it's a RPG where you're disappointing your parents, battling your exes. Uh, you're also cooking and skating. It's a ton of fun, very colorful. Uh, so hopefully we'll get to share more of that later this year. Cool, uh, Madison. Yeah, I'm on Instagram and ArtStation and uh, as uh, Cloud Engine and probably a bunch of other places that I don't remember. But like, yeah, if you type that in, you'll either get like some corporate website or maybe you'll get me. So. And Josh. Uh, OK, well, there's the aforementioned Josh Foreman YouTube channel and Twitch channel. Uh, I'm on Twitter at Joshua Foreman, just to throw everyone off. Uh, I've got an Instagram, Breath of Life Dev. No, it's Josh Foreman, Breath of Life Dev. There you go. And then finally, uh, the game I'm working on, Blanco's Block Party. If you want to get into level design, level art, and learning it, uh, it's a great free game. You get to build levels and play them with your friends. So, yeah. Cool. Uh, well, that's all we have for the panel today. Uh, thank you all to our panelists for coming and sharing your stories and your expertise with everyone here. Um, and we hope you all have a good night. Thank you. <laughs>